15-year-old James Fairweather was handed a life sentence for stabbing a man over a hundred times and then drilling the knife into the eyes of another woman, marking the beginning of his dark journey behind bars. These are the stories of the most feared kids in prison. Number 10. Jasmine Richardson Jasmine wrote to Jeremy stating that she had a plan which begins with me killing them and ends with me living with you. April 23, 2006. Jasmine Richardson and her 23-year-old boyfriend, Jeremy Steink, carefully carried out the murder of her entire family. Steink fatally stabbed Jasmine's parents, Mark and Deborah Richardson, while Jasmine was responsible for attacking her brother, Jacob, with a knife, leading to the tragic deaths of all three family members. So we gotta ask, how did it get to this point? Jasmine's parents didn't approve of her relationship with Steink. I mean, the age difference was huge. They even grounded her because of it. And it wasn't just her parents who thought this whole thing was a total disaster. Her friends didn't like it either. But the crazy part is, Steink actually proposed to Jasmine after they got caught, and she said yes. They used to chat online within those vampirefreaks.com or Nexopia websites that Canadian youth were into at the time. It's fitting to know that just a few hours before they went on their killing spree, they sat and watched Natural Born Killers, and casually chatted about carrying their gruesome plans in a similar way. July 2007, when Jasmine was only 13 years old, she had her trial. Well, she was found guilty of three counts of first-degree murder, becoming the youngest person in Canada to ever be convicted of multiple murders. The court sentenced her to 10 years in prison, considering the time she had already served. Following that, she spent four years in a psychiatric institution and another four and a half years under supervision in the community. September 2011, things took an unexpected turn when she was released from the psychiatric hospital. And by next year, reports started coming out saying her rehabilitation was going well. Experts did believe her remorse for what she did was genuine. May 2016, and her sentence was complete. Jeremy Steink, on the other hand, admitted to the murders during a conversation with an undercover officer while in custody. December 15, 2008, he received three concurrent life sentences, one for each first-degree murder count, being eligible for parole after 25 years. Number 9. Lionel Tate The now 14-year-old Lionel Tate was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. July 28, 1999 Lionel Alexander Tate, who was only 12 years old, was alone with Tiffany Eunuch in Broward County, Florida. During this time, Tiffany was assaulted by Tate, as he later admitted to putting her in a headlock before she accidentally bumped her head on the table, leading to her death. About 45 minutes later, Tate informed his mother that Tiffany wasn't breathing. And guess what? Upon examination, Tiffany's body showed signs of severe physical abuse, including bruises on her legs and feet, and marks on her neck indicative of significant Force. She also had a fractured skull, torn liver, broken rib, and a swollen brain. The prosecution noted that her injuries were consistent with those expected from a three-story fall. In the aftermath of this gruesome discovery, Lionel Tate faced the justice system. He was put on trial and, shockingly, convicted of first-degree murder. But what set this case apart was the application of the felony murder rule, a legal concept that led to Tate's conviction. This rule didn't require proof of intent to kill or injure. It was enough that Tate knowingly abused another child who tragically lost her life. Lionel Tate was one of the youngest Americans ever to have received such a severe sentence. Now, even some members of the jury began questioning the trial's outcome. Tate's sentence was absolutely mind-blowing. Can you believe this 12-year-old is the youngest person to ever get life imprisonment without parole in the whole history of the U.S.? It caused a huge uproar. It started a big debate on how messed up the justice system can be when it comes to kids. January 2004, the state appeals court overturned his conviction because they were worried that his mental state hadn't been properly checked out before the trial. It's crazy, right? So he ended up making a plea deal and got out of prison, but he was stuck at home with an ankle monitor and had to follow probation rules. Now, here's where things go from bad to worse. May 2005, he got hit with a whole new set of charges. This time, it was armed burglary with battery, armed robbery, and breaking his probation. I mean, talk about a messed up situation. Tate straight up scared the crap out of the pizza delivery guy by pointing a gun at him and even had assaulted someone else. His legal battles just kept going. He had all these plea bargains and different sentences thrown at him, but in the end, he ended being locked up at the Charlotte Correctional Institution. It's a sad and tragic journey, no doubt about it. Number 8. Craig Price 
Out of state. That's what I wanted to do. Now 41, Price has been behind bars for 26 years. When you get out. Get off my d yo. That's what you can do. Get off. July 27th, 1987. In good old Warwick, Rhode Island, Greg Chandler Price broke into a house just a couple of doors down from his own. And without even thinking twice, he grabbed a knife from the kitchen and brutally stabbed this poor woman named Rebecca Spencer 58 times until she lost her life. And if you could believe it, that was just the beginning of Price's nightmarish crime spree. September 1st, 1989, Price, now 15 and starting high school, was completely out of his mind on weed and LSD. This guy mercilessly murdered three of his own neighbors. This lady named Joan Heaton, who was only 39, got hit with 57 stab wounds. And her daughter Jennifer got brutally stabbed 62 times. But it gets worse. Her other daughter Melissa had her freaking skull crushed and got stabbed a horrifying 30 times. You couldn't write this stuff. It was pure evil. The handles of the knives even snapped off during the attacks, leaving the blades buried inside these poor people's bodies. Tell me as clearly and as best you can what occurred there. She didn't say anything. She was just like trying to, like, as soon as she seen it, like, like run the other way. Now, you'd think Price would feel at least bad about what he did, right? Well, no. Not even close. The guy had zero remorse. He owned up to the heinous crimes without batting an eye. He even blamed his messed up childhood for his behavior, saying that white folks treating him like trash fueled his hatred. Apparently, it all started when he was a little guy and a bunch of white adults started shouting slurs at him and tried to run him over. That's when he first wished someone dead. The law tried to hide Price's criminal history, but his crimes were too messed up to ignore. So they had to change the rules in Rhode Island, allowing kids to be treated like adults when they did some crazy serious stuff. But sadly, those changes couldn't apply to Price. I'm going to kill every officer I can get my hands on just like I killed those little kids. Let me tell you, Price's run-in with the justice system was far from over. Even while locked up, this guy continued to be violent and get himself into all kinds of trouble. He was charged with things like criminal contempt, extortion, assault, and breaking the terms of his probation. It's like he just couldn't stop stirring up trouble. Today, Craig Price is still in prison at the Union Correctional Institution in Rayford, Florida. While he may not be the most famous inmate, his crimes and other brutal nature ensure that he is one of the most feared individuals behind bars. Number 7. Jordan Brown he was just a boy when he was convicted of killing his father's pregnant girlfriend. Now, Jordan Brown is a man. February 20th, 2009. In New Beaver, Pennsylvania, Kenzie Marie Hook, who was pregnant and just eight months away from becoming a mom, was shot in the back of her head while sleeping in her own bed. It's really hard to even picture this kind of story. And sadly, both Kenzie and her unborn baby didn't make it through that day. What's even more horrifying about this case is the person accused of doing it was just a kid. Jordan Brown was pretty young when it happened, but because of Pennsylvania law, he was charged as an adult. This caused a lot of controversy and got people talking about whether it was right to treat such a young person like that. The police thought they found the murder weapon, a shotgun that Jordan had actually received as a Christmas present from his dad. They found a shotgun shell near the path that Jordan took with Kenzie's older daughter to catch the school bus, and that led him to getting arrested. The whole thing turned into a big legal battle. Amnesty International got involved because they didn't think treating Jordan like an adult was fair. They were worried that he could get life in prison with no no chance of parole, and they thought that was against the rules of international law for minors. April 13th, 2012, after three days of proceedings, Judge Hodge found Jordan Brown responsible for first-degree murder and homicide, ruling him as a troubled individual. Now, under Pennsylvania law, Jordan could only be held in custody until his 21st birthday. At first, Jordan was put into an adult jail, but later moved to a juvie center. June 13th, 2016, over seven years after his arrest. He was let out on probation, but his conviction as a juvenile still stayed on his record. But hold on, the legal battle didn't stop there. July 18th, 2018, there were a bunch of appeals, and eventually the Pennsylvania Supreme Court reversed Jordan's conviction. They said there wasn't enough proof and had doubts about the shotgun they found in his room being the actual weapon used in the murder. Number 6. James Fairweather I stabbed him first there. I've done it a few times. 
when I was doing that, my voices were laughing and laughing and laughing. 18 year old James Fairweather went all wild on James Atfield, who had been in a car accident before and had some brain injuries. Atfield ended up with over a hundred stab wounds. But wait, Fairweather wasn't satisfied with just that. June 17th. This time, Fairweather went after a Saudi student named Nahid Almania, who was studying at the University of Essex. He stabbed her in the gut and then straight up forced that blade into her eyes, saying he was trying to save her from witnessing evil. Born 1999, Fairweather became one of UK's youngest convicted felons. And honestly, his life was all messed up from the start. He had trouble with school, and on top of that, he had dyslexia that nobody even knew about. So you can imagine the mess starting to build up. 2012, the demise of his grandmother further caused him to become unstable. Trust me, that was just the tip of the iceberg for this guy. So, because of Fairweather's actions, the town of Colchester was a freaking mess. People were scared and paranoid. They started chopping down hedges to get rid of these hiding spots for attackers, and the cops were working their butts off, interrogating everybody, including Fairweather himself. May 27, 2015 someone out walking their dog saw something strange and called the cops. They showed up pretty quick, finding Fairweather with rubber gloves and a blade. Yeah, his downfall was pretty much inevitable at that point. January 2016, Fairweather came up with a sneaky plan as his trial loomed. He said he didn't commit murder, but asked for a lesser charge of manslaughter, insisting that he had some mental issues. But you know what? The experts didn't buy that and said he wasn't as crazy as he claimed. Once the trial ended and Fairweather was found guilty, Julie Atfield, James Atfield's mom, didn't hold back. She called him a monster for what he did to her son. April 29, 2016. The big finale came. They sentenced him to life in prison, with him spending at least 27 years behind bars. Number 5. Nehemiah Grigo. Nehemiah being in segregated confinement for almost a year and a half now, um, we would like a setting as soon as possible. January 19, 2013. 15-year-old Nehemiah Grigo heartlessly shot his mom with a 22 rifle. And if you think that was messed up, his brother Zephaniah woke up to see the horror and got shot by Nehemiah as well. Nehemiah didn't stop there. He went after his two sisters, Jael and Angelina. They were woken up by that terrifying sound, and sadly, they also met that same tragic fate. What's more, Nehemiah, driven by some unexplainable rage, actually waited for his dad to come back home. His dad, Greg Rigo, was 51 years old and used to be a well-known pastor. He came back home at around 5 a.m., completely clueless about this nightmare that had unfolded. Nehemiah ambushed him, shooting him multiple times with an AR-15 type gun. Later that day, he intended to take more lives in a public place and was even thinking about a big showdown with the cops. But fate had other ideas. He ended up at his church and shockingly confessed to a member of the congregation that his family was dead. Well, that confession raised alarms, especially with a retired detective present. When they visited Grigo's house, the gruesome scene inside confirmed their worst fears. After he was apprehended, the legal issues that followed became very complicated. I am sorry for taking our parents and our sins. I wish I could take it back. January 2015. Even though Nehemiah made a bone-chilling confession, the law didn't see him as a full-grown adult. 2019. They slapped him with that adult sentence. So Nehemiah ended up with three life sentences plus seven more years all at the same time. Because they considered his time already spent in detention, he'll have a chance at parole after serving 30 years. Right now, he's locked up in the Lee County Correctional Center with nowhere else to go. Number 4. T.J. Lane Parents of the victims called Lane a monster and wished him a slow, torturous death. February 27, 2012. Six Chardon High School students got caught up in this brutal shooting that was all over the news. Three of them lost their lives. Two got hurt and one has to deal with paralysis now. And the person responsible for this tragedy is 17-year-old ex-student Thomas Michael T.J. Lane. By the evening, everything was just super tense. The cops had caught the shooter, but get this, he didn't even go to Chardon anymore. He was at another school called Lake Academy Alternative School. He caused all the chaos with a 22 caliber handgun and they found him near his car, not too far away from the school. Once they arrested him, the legal issues started moving. Lane was facing some serious charges 
charges, with three counts of aggravated murder and a bunch of attempted murder. But here's the situation. Since he was only 17, there was a big discussion about whether they should treat him like a kid or like an adult. May 2012, they made a decision. He was going to face the charges as an adult. Now, here's the insane part. Lane admitted he did all those things. And a year later, they sentenced him to three consecutive life sentences with no chance of parole. They made sure he'd never see the outside world again. And the sick thing is, when this kid was sentenced, he had the audacity to smirk and show his little finger to the grieving families without a shred of remorse. Throughout their statements, Lane just smiled. Then at one point, even raised his middle finger to victims' families. And his statement to the court, just too vulgar to say. February 29th, 2012. Some troubling details came to light when they dug deeper into his records. December 2009. Lane had already been in handcuffs not once, but twice. In one incident, he actually took part in an assault on his own uncle. And he also struck another boy in a separate incident. September 11, 2014. Lane and two other inmates made headlines once again by trying to pull off a daring escape from Allen Correctional Institution in Lima, Ohio. Imagine their luck. Their escape didn't last long, though. Lane was caught and thrown back behind bars the very next day. To tighten security, they quickly transferred all three of them to Ohio State Penitentiary, a much stricter facility. Number 3. Sierra Halseth Welcome back to our YouTube channel. <laughs> they recorded this video. Day 3 after <laughs> marrying somebody. Whoa! April 9th, 2021. Firefighters discovered the burning body of 45-year-old Daniel Halseth in his garage. His daughter Sierra and her boyfriend Aaron Guerrero were responsible. The couple had stabbed Daniel 70 times, moved his body to the garage, and set it on fire to make it look like an accident. These two were seriously messed up. Not only did they take Daniel's life, but they also tried to burn down his house before making a run for it. They even used his car and debit card to escape to Salt Lake City. Talk about stupid and heartless. Now, thankfully, the authorities wasted no time and caught them pretty quickly. The legal battle that followed would be a long one. Eventually, District Judge Tierra Jones threw the book at him, giving him both life sentences and ordering him to pay $5,000 in restitution. The charges against these two were no joke. These included things like murder with a deadly weapon, conspiracy to commit murder, arson, robbery with a deadly weapon, conspiracy to commit robbery, and using credit or debit cards fraudulently. These two had a laundry list of crimes to answer for. But here's where things get even more messed up. Sierra and Guerrero's relationship was already causing problems with their parents, especially when they found out about their plan to run away together to LA. Guess what? Guerrero actually ran away from home just days before the murder. It's like they were planning this sick thing for a while. To make matters worse, these two twisted teens went ahead and bought tools and supplies for their gruesome act from local stores. During the hearing, Sierra made startling allegations against her father, claiming she suffered sexual and physical abuse, which drove her to drink alcohol. These accusations added a layer of complexity to an already tragic case. Sierra Hall says claiming her father abused her. He locks me in place and starts pushing me and hitting me around. Overall, both their statements left the courtroom with a cloud of mixed emotions. Their apologies and explanations had shed light on the tangled web of motives behind their actions. While there was no denying the harm they'd caused, there seemed to be deeper issues at play that the court needed to consider. They both should have gotten death for the life they took. 20 years will never be enough for taking down one. In the trial's aftermath, emotions rang high among family members with some wishing for harsher punishment. As Sierra and Guerrero were given a life sentence with the possibility of parole after 22 years. Number 2. Philip Chisholm Philip Chisholm has been found guilty of brutally raping and murdering his ninth grade teacher when he was just 14 years old. October 22, 2013. 14-year-old Philip Chisholm, armed with a box cutter, followed Colleen Ritzer, a math teacher, into the school restroom where he brutally murdered her before disposing her body in a garbage can behind the school. And if that wasn't enough, he went and used her credit card to buy a movie ticket with her blood still staining his hands. Born January 21st, 1999, Philip, a recent transplant from Tennessee to Danvers, wasn't well known at the school. Some described him as antisocial and out of it. Adding to his troubles, his mother was going through a difficult divorce. 
Colleen Ritzer, a 24-year-old math teacher at the school, was known for her kindness and dedication to her students. She often went above and beyond to help them succeed academically. On that fateful day, she offered to assist Chisholm with his studies after school. However, what followed was a horrific and unthinkable act. Prosecutors say the gloves he brings into the bathroom are evidence of him taking her body and wheeling it to the woods just a few yards away from the school she so loved. The morning of the incident, Chisholm arrived at school with a disturbing plan. He had with him a box cutter, mask, gloves, and a change of clothing in his bags. Security camera would capture him stalking Ritzer before he entered the restroom, donning gloves. Inside, he robbed, raped, and fatally stabbed her 16 times with the box cutter. Throughout the crime, Chisholm changed his appearance multiple times, showing careful planning. He left the school with a hood over his head, returned wearing a different outfit, and dragged her body in a recycling bin to a wooded area behind the school. There, he committed another unspeakable act. When both Chisholm and Ritzer failed to return after school, they were reported missing. Blood was discovered in the bathroom, along with Ritzer's bag and bloody clothing, near the woods. Police eventually identified Chisholm as a suspect through CCTV and found incriminating evidence in his possession. Chisholm was indicted for the murder, aggravated and armed robbery of Colleen Ritzer. February 26, 2016, he was tried as an adult and was sentenced to serve at least 40 years in prison. And number one, Beaver Brothers. Are you the only one there? No, my brother's attacking my family. Your dad is attacking your family? No, my brother. <laughs> July 22, 2015, in the quiet little town of Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, it was around 11.30 p.m. when the police received a 911 call from Daniel Beaver. He was reporting that his brothers were murdering their family. These two brothers, Robert and Michael Beaver, armed with knives and a hatchet, carried out a meticulously planned attack on their own family members. Now, it's hard to believe, but autopsies later revealed the full extent of that violence. Their father, David, had suffered at least 28 stab wounds, while their mother, April, had endured over 48 wounds. Even their siblings, Daniel, Christopher, and Victoria, weren't spared. Two of the kids had 21 wounds and the other 23, respectively. It's truly shocking. But amidst all this chaos, there were two siblings who survived. Crystal somehow made it through, despite having her throat slit and stab wounds on her stomach and arms. And Autumn, thankfully, was found unharmed. What's even more distressing is that the brothers had actually planned this whole gruesome act in advance. They'd even mentioned that plans for the killing were stored on flash drives in their home. Later on, they revealed that they had intended to film the aftermath of their horrifying deeds. It's just unthinkable. That's not all, because these twisted individuals had even bigger ambitions. They wanted to create a massacre that could rival the infamous tragedy at Columbine High School back in 99. Authorities also looked into a shipment of boxes containing 3,000 rounds of ammunition that were believed to have been delivered a day before. In the aftermath, the brothers faced the court. Robert Beaver eventually pleaded guilty to all charges, receiving a life sentence without the possibility of parole. April 2018, Michael Beaver's trial, on the other hand, began and ended with him being sentenced to life in prison with the chance of parole in August 2018. Right now, Robert's in jail at the Joseph Harp Correctional Center, and Michael is over at Lexington Correctional Center. Both jails are in Lexington, Oklahoma.